Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'd like to start the previous speakers in uh, thanking the organizers, uh, first of all, for bringing us all here and for um, giving me the opportunity to present some of my group's work um, in Basel University. So um, when I uh, went through the progr program of that conference, I um, essentially decided to change a bit the topic of my talk and um, make this a bit more in the spirit of this hybrid conference. So there's going to be a hybrid talk about two relatively disconnected um, topics. On one hand, I'll talk about our recent and, and partly not so recent results here on using single spins for nanoscale quantum sensing with a particular focus on our work on uh, studying superconductivity or magnetic effects in superconductors using this technique. Um, and then in the second half or, or, or so of my talk, I'll talk a bit about our hybrid quantum systems here where we take individual spins coupled to mechanical oscillators and there the focus will be mostly on unconventional spin dynamics that this oscillator can imprint onto the spins. So you probably see some striking similarity between this program and what you heard three talks ago uh, by Anya. I still hope I can ent entertain you maybe by you know bringing some distinctive features from, from the, this experiment. So uh, thanks to a very nice uh, introduction we've had from Vincent before, I can actually dive right into the topic um, um, and present to you the heart of the experiments that we're doing. So again, Vincent presented the general idea, which is to take a single electron spin here as a nanoscale sensor for magnetic fields or potentially other things, and to bring this very close to some interesting magnetic structures here, um, close so you get a high spatial resolution, which can be on the order here of 10 nanometers. And so what you want to do is to have a nicely quantum coherence spin so that we can ultimately exploit and build on this quantum coherence to also push sensitivities um, uh, uh, as, as far as possible. And you will, of course, not be surprised that we do all of this using NV centers in diamond. You could, in principle, use any um, spin, but the NVs just bring a lot of very useful features. In particular, they let us apply this idea to room temperature ambient condition, but also uh, go into cryogenics. So one of the reasons why we um, uh, think, or I certainly think that this is a very powerful technique, or some past, I would say, proof of concept experiments that we and others have done using this particular um, approach here, where we're able to show that indeed you can use such scanning and V centers to, for instance, sense the stray magnetic field of a single electron spin, and you can combine this with um, spatial resolutions here on the order of 20 nanometers or so, as discussed earlier in this session. And all of this can be done in a rather non-invasive way, in a very robust uh, way, and it's, it's a quantitative method. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we exploit this quantitative um, aspect in the experiments that we're doing. Okay, so of course, uh, we're not the only ones interested in NV magnetometry, and I would say since those foundational experiments in 2008 that, that Vincent had presented, there was almost an explosion of activities worldwide. Here is just a very small subsection um, of, of uh, experiments that have been published over the last year, so don't be sad if I forgot yours. This is certainly not everything that is around. Um, and I'm not going through these individual experiments because actually many of these you will hear about in this conference. But with this slide, I'd like to make two points, which is on one hand, at least as far as I see the, the, the field, it's really splitting into two domains, sort of applications in life sciences and biology, and on the other hand, applications in more fundamental physics questions, uh, uh, mostly here in the, in the regime of, of solid state physics. So that's the one uh, message of this slide. The other one is to show you that indeed NV magnetometry has now matured to an extent that actually industries start to be interested in that. And this is shown by this example down here. This is a recent paper which was a collaboration between Stuttgart University and Seagate. And Seagate really um, liked this approach of NV magnetometry here to characterize their magnetic read and write heads for their newest generation of hard drives. Um, and again, this, this exemplifies that this is now getting becoming more than just an academic exercise to use um, this, this technology. Good, so now we're, we in Basel are definitely active um, uh, also on this side here. The interest of my group is to use NV magnetometry in the broadest sense uh, uh, for applications in condensed matter physics. And here I'd like to maybe highlight two key directions that we currently work on. This is on one hand um, activities at room temperature where we're interested in 
nanoscale magnetism. And in particular, as Vincent described uh, before, uh, we really started to be interested very much in these applications in anti-ferromagnetic spintronics. And you've already seen this image before, so I'm actually not spending much time of this on this, just to tell you that what you see here are stray fields generated by domains of, a, of, of an anti-ferromagnetic, a chromium oxide, and using any magnetometry, we could not only make these domain images, we can also do something more quantitative. And in particular for this material, this was a thin film, granular, um, uh, uh, well, film of chromium oxide, we could uh, sort of pinpoint the mechanism of domain formation and also, for instance, things like the exchange interaction between neighboring grains. So I'm not talking about this in my talk, but I want just to launch this in case somebody wants to discuss this um, later on uh, in this conference. Now, in parallel to this, we're also very interested in bringing NV magnetometry into cryogenic environments where there's a lot of exciting applications, um, uh, I would say, in, in mesoscopic physics. I'm thinking things like current imaging in, 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 in low dimensional systems, quantum Hall physics, or as I'll discuss mostly today, uh, things like vortices uh, in, in superconductors. Okay, but before I go into these um, applications, I'd like to present you the workhorse that we use in Basel uh, for these type of experiments. And these are those um, all diamond scanning probes that again, you've quickly heard about uh, by Vincent this, this morning. So this was a technique that uh, really dates back to my time as a postdoc with Amelia Jacobi, but that's something that we have now established in Basel um, and, and are using essentially for the last uh, three to four years now for these applications that I'll see you'll see in a little bit. So what you see here um, is a, um, a nano-structured device sculptured out of high-purity single crystalline diamond. There is an NV center in there, which we place at the apex of this tip using um, uh, iron implantation. And then this object here is attached using some holding bar here to a quartz tuning fork, which is used for force sensing for tip distance control in AFM. Now you see that this um, uh, uh, spin here, this NV center, is sitting at an angle to normal. That's because these are single crystalline probes made out of one zero zero material. And as I hear you heard before, the NV center to first order at least is only sensitive to fields along the spin quantization axis. And this will become later important later on when we look at actual data. Now these structures um, really allow us to um, essentially have quite nice operational conditions for scanning NV magnetometry. In partic particular, the pillars here that make the scanning probe are actually shape, uh, shaped in a, in a, well, not in an arbitrary shape. We, we optimize them to funnel most of the light from the NV center here into our detection optics, which sits up here. And so we typically get count rates on the order of a million counts per second for a single NV. And that we have a single NV we can show by using by doing here these photon or autocorrelation measurements. And then lastly, just a word on coherence. In principle, these single crystal tips also allow us to get decent coherence times. Uh, here you see an example of about 80 microseconds, and I should stress that this is a typical best example. In fact, it's the best example we've ever seen. So that's certainly still a challenge on the material side that we're working on, but I would say more typical times on the order of 40 to 50 microseconds. And these are spin echo T2 times here. Now, all of this works uh, quite nicely. I mentioned before already that we're using these tips for quite some time now we're with, a, with various applications that have been demonstrated. And I would say this has triggered quite some attention. I mean, Vincent is interested in these tips, others are as well. And the combination of this interest that we are sensing in the community and the robustness and performance of these tips recently led us to make the step to actually commercialize this technology. And I hope you forgive me my one advertisement slide. So this is our spin-off company that we recently funded in, in Basel. It's called Qunami. With that, we're commercializing those tips. And uh, you know, if you, if you want to purchase one, it comes nicely packaged here so it doesn't break when you get it. Um, and so uh, these are sort of the applications we have in mind. If you want to see details about this, either go to the website or of course, come, come talk to me um, anytime in this, in this conference. Good, so after this um, intro into the technology, I want to go into this uh, first application I, I promised you, and this is the use of NV magnetometry to study um, superconductivity in a particular vortices um, in, 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 in this high temperature superconductor, YBCO. Uh, 
So uh, just very quick intro, what are vortices? So essentially a vortex, uh, vortices are the, the response of a certain type of superconductor, so-called type two superconductors, to being exposed to an external magnetic field. So we know superconductors don't like magnetic fields, so typically they just expel them by virtue of the Meissner effect. But for certain superconductors, these type two superconductors, if you cross this first critical field, it becomes energetically favorable for them to admit those quantized flux bundles into the superconductor. Um, and essentially these, these, these flux bundles are generated by supercurrents in the superconductor, which extend over typical lengths given by the, by the London penetration uh, depth. So why did we choose to look at uh, such vortices? Well, they have techno technological re relevance in particular for um, uh, superconductors, which are used for instance in magnets. Um, uh, vortex dynamics can limit the critical current density that you can send through these materials essentially because a current um, uh, uh, acts as a transverse force on, on, on a vortex and can lead to deepening of vortices and this in turn leads to energy dissipation into a superconductor which can then break superconductivity. So there is technological interest in understanding and seeing vortices in more detail but linked to this, um, uh, to this process of pinning there are also still open questions in in vortex physics, for instance, these pinning centers that may or may not hold the vortex in place are not very well understood and it would be nice to have a handle to understanding and studying vortex dynamics there a bit better. And then lastly, of course, since this was at first place a technology project also to bring ND magnetometry to cryogenic conditions, this was a very nice, nice test target for us essentially to validate, vali to validate the operation of our magnetometer since these are terms of the stray field in the particular superconductor we look at, these are rather well understood um, objects. Okay, so uh, we decided to look at this particular superconductor YBCO exactly for the reason I just told you before, YBCO is very deep into this type 2 superconductor limit, therefore stray fields as you see in a little bit can be calculated and modeled quite, quite nicely. So we looked at this um, uh, 150 nanometer thin film of YBCO, this was grown by our colleagues here um, in Tübingen. And the way we prepared that sample, the way we nucleated vortices um, in, in this IPCO film was by field cooling, which I think was mentioned already before. So what you did was to start with our sample here in the normal phase with an applied field. You would then cool this down into the superconducting phase here into this vortex phase. In principle, we could start our measurement at this point. It turns out our setup is much more stable if you're a base temperature so we can cool down further um, and now owing to pinning, to rather strong pinning in this particular film we have here, actually even if we go into the Meissner phase, the vortices don't escape the film, they stay trapped on their pinning sites. And we can even ramp the magnetic field close to zero and then start studying our um, vortices. So long story short, uh, we did our first uh, image here of NV magnetometry. Uh, just in terms of the approach that we took here, this is a scan where at each pixel essentially we stop our scan, we take a full ESR spectrum, we move on, and then afterwards we just post-process these data to extract the projection of the stray magnetic field onto the NV um, direction. So this is not a fast process, such an image takes on the order of an hour or a little bit more to take, but then you see those individual vortices um, uh, essentially threading uh, through your, your IPCO film. So you can go in and uh, zoom into one of these vortices to look into a bit uh, more details. This is now a high resolution scan, therefore it takes a bit longer. Um, um, and while well you can make a say consistency check if everything works and for instance, integrate up the full, uh, the whole field that's threading here through the, through the Z direction. And what you get is something that's very much consistent with this flux quantum of, um, uh, I think there's a mistake, it's 20 Gauss micron squared. Um, so you may wonder why this object is so distorted, right? We're looking at a vortex, which in general should be rather um, symmetric. Well, this has now exactly to do with the aspect that this NV magnetometer is a vector magnetometer and we're measuring fields along the quantization axis of the NV center. And this can be visualized in this sketch here. So it turns out these vortex stray fields in the zeroth order approximation, you can just model them as a monopole. Essentially it's an effective magnetic monopole which sits one penetration depth under the superconductor surface. So these are these monopole lines. And then you see as you scan your 
angled NV center across this field profile, you have on one hand a very small uh, negative field projection onto this NV axis that will correspond to this point here. And if you go all the way on the other side, well, you have a strong and positive projection, projection on the field lines onto the NV center, and that will be this peak there. Now that's nice, that gives us qualitative understanding. It turns out if you want to use this monopole model for a quantitative fit, um, it, it fails. So this was our best effort to fit a monopole to our data. And I should say this is a model that usually works quite well. This has been used, I would say, in the majority of published works on vortex imaging. And there's actually a lot of literature out there um, on, on fire experiments. So we had to dig a bit deeper. Um, and it turns out that, well, the monopole model, model is a good approximation, but only if you're far from the superconductor compared to lambda, compared to its penetration depth. If you get close to superconductor surface, there is some bending of those field lines, and you can um, essentially get to those by, by solving the London, uh, London's equations for the su superconducting film. And there is a particularly well-known solution, which is called the Perl solution, which is valid for these thin film uh, superconductors. Okay, so using this, this equation, uh, we get, I would say, a near-perfect fit, as you see here. That's certainly something reassuring, but it's also something useful, because this fit gives us right away the two key parameters of this experiment, which are, on one hand, the distance between the NV center and the sample uh, surface, and as, as was mentioned many times uh, now, this is essentially the spatial resolution of this image, which is on the order of 30 nanometers. And secondly, this gives us the penetration depth, which we find to be on the order of 250 nanometers, and it's very consistent with previous um, literature values. So we think that this could be something nice. It's usually quite difficult to locally measure penetration depth, and, and in particular to measure it in absolute values. People typically measure changes in penetration depth, but don't get this absolute value, so that could be something nice to pursue. In particular, looking at temperature evolution of uh, the changes of the uh, penetration depth with, with, with temperature can give interesting clues about the nature of superconductivity in a particular material. This is from the fit. Yes, yes, absolutely. Th was that not clear? So, so yes, is it here from the Perl? Two, two. Lambda and Z. The direction is fixed because we know it very well. Uh, we have a, a vector magnet. By sweeping that, you can measure this. Um, right, so so this would be a nice avenue to pursue, and, um, and, and you want to do that in the future to study lambda more systematically. There is one drawback to this approach, which is that A, you need a vortex, so it's not applicable to type 1 superconductors, and B, this is a very local measurement. I mean, I, I, I sold this before as an advantage. It can also be an issue. I mean, maybe, maybe the superconductor looks a bit different around the pinning side than it does otherwise. So that motivated us to also look into other methods to measure lambda. And one is actually offered by this um, Meissner phase here, which I, which I introduced before. So um, in fact, um, well, if you look into details of how this, this Meissner expulsion um, out of a superconductor works, it only works to an efficiency that's essentially given by the penetration depth. So these field lines will penetrate to some extent into your superconductor, even though um, it's supposed to screen the fields, and that's what we wanted to see. And well, um, well, for that, we patterned our superconducting film here into these circles. We see them in topography, and sure enough, if you look at the stray field above this disk, we again see this distortion to the field, which is now due to the Meissner effect um, uh, uh, across, this, across this disk. Now, very similarly to what I, I've done before with the vortex, we can now here take a line cut, we can understand the line cut in a qualitative way, again, with such a um, field line uh, picture, which I'm not walking you through now. And we can do a fit to this line cut now the the, to, to extract essentially the penetration depth. The downside compared to the previous method was that, at least to our knowledge, there is no analytic formula to that. So this is essentially a numerical fit. But still, it gives us the same two quantities, NV to sample distance and penetration depth. And we find this very much in accordance to what I've shown you um, before on the on the vortex. Good. So just to conclude this part and maybe complete the picture here, what you can also do with these type of images is, and, and with any type of magnetic images, is to reverse propagate them to the source to essentially learn something directly about the source. And we've also done this here. There are some well-known algorithms or protocols for this, which you can 
read up here, and that allows us essentially to reconstruct the supercurrent which is um, uh, flowing in this disk and which is responsible for this for this Meissner screening. You could also do then the fitting on this data if you if you wish, but this data may also you know teach you something about this superconductor. For instance, there's this little kink here which was not visible here in topography, so something is going on there that ob obviously destroys our superconductor. Good, so um, that was it for the superconductor, just a little outlook of where we want to go. We've heard now a couple of times um, the, this, the, the, the possibility of using NV centers also as essentially a noise detector or noise spectrometer. We, that's something we'd like to apply to our vortices here. I mentioned before a pinned vortex here can undergo thermal or Brownian uh, motion in its pinning potential, so this will give you a peak in the noise spectral density around the uh, the trap frequency of this pinning site. We'd like to explore this um, um, in imaging. This is a sort of proof of concept experiment that just shows you that we can combine relaxometry with imaging. This is a room temperature experiment where we essentially map T1, whatever T1 means, um, as a function of position over permaloid disk. And you see that there's, there's a clear contrast, so we now want to bring this to low temperature and look at vortices. We're also interested in looking at less trivial vortices, for instance, vortices which occur just on the crossover between the type two and type one superconductivity. There the stray fields are less easy to understand and we could maybe check different approaches and models there. And lastly, we also have ongoing activities in pushing NV magnetometry to yet lower temperatures. In particular, we have a Dilfrey button running in Basel now with, with this, this we ultimately would like to look at more exotic uh, superconductors maybe. Good, so with that, I'd like to make the switch to the second part of my talk. Uh, maybe there's questions now, I'd be happy to take them, or otherwise do them in the end, yes. Well, I mean, in IPCO it's one nanometer, so uh, it's gonna be challenging. Well, that's, but the coherence length is exactly the motivation for this. I mean, uh, there are materials where, you know, well, lambda and psi are comparable, that's just between type one and type two. Yes, so um, you could think about measuring um, uh, magnetic susceptibility, and that gives you a measure of the of the superfluid density in the superconductor, and that falls off with psi, not with lambda, if you have you know if you're on a domain boundary or, or around the vortex. So there are ideas how one could do this with NV magnetometry, and we can maybe discuss those offline. Good. Um, so with that, I come to the second part of my talk um, about these hybrid spin mechanical systems. Um, uh, th that I promised, so I think I can be very brief on the introduction because there was Peter's uh, tutorial yesterday and, and, and um, Anya's, Anya's talk before. Essentially what we're interested in exploring here is a system where we have NV central spins coupled to mechanical oscillators. And the motivation I would say is twofold. It's in one hand maybe to use this again as a sensing device in one way or another, and then ultimately in the far future to bring this into the quantum coherent regime where you could use the mechanical oscillator as a bus to maybe couple remote envies. And now the, the coupling we're exploiting, similarly to, to what you've heard before, is actually crystal strain. Uh, so you bend the cantilever, it strains the envy, and it couples in a way I'll, I'll show you uh, in a little bit. And the reason we think this is an interesting avenue to pursue is that, well, first the individual consist constituents of this, of this uh, uh, setup here have rather attractive properties, high Q factors for the mechanics, low coherence times for the envy, and this coupling mediated by strain is intrinsic to the system. So it's free of drifts, for instance, you don't need to place the envy close to some strong field gradients. And as I'll show you in this talk, the coupling can also give rise to rather interesting non-trivial spin dynamics, which we're currently studying um, here. Okay, so this is how the sample actually looks like. These are just diamond cantilevers which we fabricate which are hanging off an edge and can happily vibrate there um, as long as we drive them. So um, this is the spin-strain coupling Hamiltonian, which I believe or hope Peter has introduced to you um, yesterday. So I'll be rather uh, brief here. And maybe the, the, the key message is that there are two distinct coupling mechanisms, either from on-axis stress or strain acting on the NV center. So this str stress does not break the symmetry of the NV and therefore simply, is, I mean, it's effective, uh, effectively a modulation of the zero field splitting and it wiggles these plus and minus one states in common mode with respect to the m is equal zero state. 
On the other hand, if you apply transverse stress to the NV, this breaks the symmetry of the center and it mixes these m is equal plus or minus one states here with these double rise raising and lowering operators. And now both these terms have interesting, um, uh, I would say, prospects. For instance, the first one here you could use for oscillator or cooling using sideband cooling, whereas the second part here was proposed in, I would say, a rather, uh, rather interesting proposal by the Looking Group as a mediator for spin squeezing in ensemble um, of NVs in such a, such a resonator. Now, the issue when we started off with these experiments was that the coupling constants here and how they're related to strain or stress that's applied to a system were essentially unknown. And that's, why, that's what motivated us uh, to do actually a very sim simple, but in the end, rather instructive experiment, namely to take these cantilevers and simply bend them and see what happens to your ODMR line. And that's what you get. So you can either apply a compressive or tensile strain to your, to your NV center, and if you do this in zero magnetic field, you see here in this color code how the ESR lines both split, that's as a function of the transverse strain, and shift, there's a common mode shift here, which is a result of on-axis strain. Now you can go through all the math, you can essentially relate these constants M here to your, sorry, that's very small down here, to your um, um, stress uh, tensor that's, that's generated by this bending and then fit this to those envies. It turns out there were actually two envies involved here. You do the fits and you get your, your coupling constants here, which again were previously unknown. So this is something new we learned about the envy. Now, of course, with regard to these quantum applications in the future, what is relevant is um, whether we can get significant cooperativity in the system. And I'm not reintroducing cooperativity. You've heard about it. I just want to give you um, the, the, the possibly disappointing result for our current experiments, so for the cantilevers I've shown you, the cooperativity turns out to be on the order of 10 to the minus 16. So that's modest at best, and uh, certainly it leaves room for improvement, and we think there is room, and I think, you know, by being moderately optimistic and, you know, hoping to go down to Dilfridge temperatures, making the system smaller, what have you, we essentially project the cooperativity of 1.2, and I was actually very happy to see that this matches Anya's estimate uh, quite well. So this is all true for the ground state. Of course, there's more games to play in the excited state, and I'm not at all talking about these. Um, I think you've heard about them um, uh, plenty enough yesterday. So what we thought was that, well, while we work on this 16 order of magnitude improvement here, which certainly brings some technical challenges and maybe goes you know, through a few generations of PhD students, we want to make sure we have something else that's interesting that we can do, and, and we think there is. So the first thing we tried was to essentially exploit this transverse strain coupling for coherent manipulation of the NV spin. So you've seen the Hamiltonian before. The experiment, in a nutshell, is simply to use a magnetic field to tune the plus to minus one spacing to resonance with your mechanical oscillator, drive the oscillator, you prepare your spin here, and you let, let the, the system essentially, well, Rabi oscillate here. And you see that this works quite well. In fact, we get rather sustained <laughs> oscillations and I think this works so well, it was to some extent a surprise to us, it works so well because the mechanical resonator has a decent Q and therefore there's rather low noise on your driving field. And in this work here, we were able to show that, well, we can bring this into a regime of strong, strong driving and we can also use this essentially to protect the spin's coherence by continuous driving. That's not what I want to discuss today. Um, I want to talk quickly in my remaining two minutes. Um, about, this was a five, five megahertz. These are a rather low frequency, yeah. So rather, I want to talk um, a, a little bit about the question that we asked ourselves immediately after this experiment. And that's the following. So see, we can now drive this plus to minus one transition coherently. And we all know that we can also drive these two microwave transitions coherently. So what happens if you now turn, off, uh, turn on all these three driving fields and look at the dynamics of the system? And that's something not necessarily trivial happens, you can think about by a Gedanken experiment, you, you know, you ask the question, if I initialize the system M is equal zero and turn on all these fields, what is the probability after a certain time to have shuffled pop um, a population up here? And the fact that you have various paths, the, different uh, the, the direct absorption or indirect, tells you already that some interference will happen and that will depend on the phase of these driving fields in one way or another. So we've done exactly that experiment. 
This is the result. So what you see here are some what generalized Rabi oscillations. So this is population in MS equals zero after initialization in zero as a function of time and global phase. And glo global phase is actually the phase you pick up by doing a round trip um, around your, your loop of the three states here. So you see that there are some points of special symmetry. For instance, these half integer values of pi. We went in there, okay, I'm really wrapping up, sorry. We went in there to look into more detail what's happening. It turns out, and that's, that's rather, rather fun maybe, that and these values of plus and minus pi over two, you get this non-reciprocal dynamics where essentially the population either shuffles in a counter, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise way th through your, through your three-level system. And this is actually in, in strong analogy to an, an ele electron essentially hopping here on a ring and this global phase then simply takes the role of an artificial gauge field or an artificial magnetic field that's applied to that ring. So um, I have to wrap up, so I'll just jump a few things um, um, and want to come maybe to, to one of the applications of this thing that we're currently exploring. You may see it already here, the, these Rabi oscillations can be more or less sustained depending on the phase you're at. It turns out this is again another form of coherence protection by continuous driving, but this works better or worse depending on what the phase here is. And we could extract these dephasing rates as you see here, and what they boil down to essentially to different pairs of dressed states generated by this driving, which can be more or less pro uh, protected. And our projection here, so this is the data, we see dress state coherence times up to 100 microseconds. We think based on simple theory, that we should be able to achieve close to T1 limited coherence protection here with rather moderate, moderate driving strength on the order of a few hundred kilohertz. But that we can discuss um, offline if you like. I think I should wrap up. Um, just an outlook here. What you want to do is definitely look at higher frequency oscillators. For instance, these nano pillars that we're using, they certainly have an interesting modes. Coupling these to spin would be very nice. And then obviously going to low temperatures uh, would also be a very nice um, perspective. So with that, I'm done. So I had to rush in the end. Thanks a lot for your attention. I'd be happy to take your questions. Yes. an interesting point but I well no you could be if you drive this at the Lamo frequency of the spin you want to sense I guess yeah sorry I um yes I g uh, well yeah you mean whether we can drive we, we can tune the resonance frequency that's the question. Oh, with a fluid? Oh, you want to put this into fluid? Oh my gosh. I try to, you know, keep any fluids away from my experiment, so I, I can't answer this question. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that, yeah. Yeah, but on average it's zero. Here on Because uh, no, it's on, in, uh, on average it's zero. I think that's the that's the point. Well, maybe you can discuss this offline. But it sounds interesting. I should say one downside. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. So one, one downside here, just to say, and to contrast this, for instance, to Greg's work, is that we cannot pulse strain. And that has to do, of course, with, with the, the Q factor. So the ring down times would be horribly long. And, and, you know, being able to pulse this. Okay, well, then let's discuss it after. Okay. No. The, the, the what, sorry? <laughs> 
though we have not measured the any type one superconductors yet, what was the second part of the question? Is there, yeah, no, we have not yet. 